Folks, it has been an incredible day, and it ain't over, because we're going to have some fun right now. And I know the table is pretty shot back there. We've only got a few copies of Behold Your Mother. But if you want, and I hope our ladies are coming back to, to, to female the table. Uh, you know, I don't want to say man the table. Uh, <laughs> To woman the table, how's that? Uh, but if you want something that we're sold out of, we can take orders and ship it to you without any shipping cost, okay? I'm going to be stealing from my book, Behold Your Mother, right now. But we've got tons of good stuff still left there. And guys, remember this. Christmas is only 11 months away. All right, I'm, I'm just saying. All right. Okay, so... The Blessed Mother was proud, that's right, no shame. <laughs> the Blessed Mother was the obstacle of obstacles for me, and I find with a lot of my convert friends, they'll say the same, you know, that the Blessed Mother was the hardest thing, it was the last thing, and for me, it was as well, but when I really dove in and started studying. Even before I was Catholic, I discovered such a wealth of biblical foundation for the Marian dogmas and doctrines, as well as historical, that now it's often the first thing I want to talk about with my Protestant friends. Because I find over and over and over again, my Protestant friends are blown away like I was. Oh my gosh, Tim, I never saw that. I never saw that. I never saw that. Well, I'm just going to share a little tidbit of what was really a labor of love of mine over many years in, that culminated three, year, three years ago in the book, Behold Your Mother. Now, folks ask me, and, and I remember when I, three years ago, I did kind of a little Catholic bookstore tour, and I went all over the place. And probably the question I was asked the most, surprisingly, was why the title? Why Behold Your Mother? And so let me start by answering this question, and then we're going to dive in, and, and I guarantee it, y'all, somebody's going to learn something. Somebody's going to learn something, and somebody's going to get happy. In fact, if we were Pentecostals, I'd be hearing shouts of amen and hallelujah after what you guys are going to hear here in a little bit. But I know we're Catholics, so we, you know. But anyway, <laughs> that's right. Be restrained, brother. You got to calm down, Timmy. You're Catholic now, brother, you know. I still can't. I can't calm down. This stuff is too good. But in writing the book and dealing so many years as I have with, the, with this topic, you know, um, I love, gosh, I guess it's one of the biggest blessings about being an apologist, really. I, I, can't, I can't believe I get paid to do this. this. It just seems wrong. But I do cash the checks. I do. <laughs> I got seven kids to feed. I got, but still, it's just, wow, this is incredible. I get to travel the world defending the Catholic faith. Just three months ago, I was at the Vatican speaking at an ecumenical, in, in, by invitation only, conference at the Vatican with world-famous Protestants that, if I named some of them, you would know. This is something that's not open to the public. It's not something we publicize, but it's absolutely phenomenal what happens and what is happening, folks, with conversions all over the world. Even in the midst of this craziness, man, we've got just incredible conversions happening all over the place. But I, I've met I, and continue to meet some of the most wonderful people. Well, one of the many... Uh, is a, an apologist by the name of Ron Rhodes. Some of you have heard of him. He wrote the book, uh, uh, Conver what is it, Conversa Conversations with Catholics? No, it's not. My br brain just blew up. What was it called? Reasoning with Catholics in the Scriptures. There it is. I'm getting old. And uh, it's actually a really good book, but of course... He's Protestant, all right? And in one place in that book, which I quote in my book, Behold Your Mother, he makes the point that, you know, that you, we hear so often, right? What is all this fuss about Mary? What is it with these Catholics? 
because he says, and I quote, Mary had only one small role to play in salvation history, just one thing, she gave birth to Jesus. Other than that, you know, she did. He actually says that. The only role she had to play was in giving birth to Jesus. After that, we see nothing of Mary. And I'm going, oh, my Lord, we see a whole lot more. But just pause for a moment and think about that. I mean, that's like saying to Abraham Lincoln's wife, well, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? <laughs> Amen. I mean, you're missing something kind of important here. It's like saying all she did was everything. Brought the whole Jesus to the whole world. Oh, my goodness. But beyond that, not only is he wrong there on his, his foundation, his first principle, but to say after that, we see nothing of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Oh, my goodness. She is, as I point out in the book, and I, and I really believe when I wrote that book, I wanted to do a book different than any book I had read on the Blessed Mother, and I've read tons of them. I wanted to give an exhaustive, apologetic defense to all of the Marian doc doctrines, not just the big four, the dogmas of Mother of God, Immaculate Conception, Perpetual Virginia Assumption, but I do queenship, I do mediatrix, co-redemptrix, the whole bit, and we haven't had a follow-up. Some of you are getting a free copy now called 20 Answers on the Blessed Mother. That was kind of the cutting room floor stuff. Uh, so the little booklet some of you are, are getting. But I think one of the most important things I've discovered that I've done and ministers to people in that book is I show you how each and every one of the Marian doctrines are crucial for your spiritual life. And I'll tell you how that really got going as a focal point of the book, because that is the focal point. After the apologetic defense, that is the focal point, how this impacts your life. I had a dear friend on EWTN, a colleague of mine, who made the point, and I happened to be watching the TV, and he said, you know, the perpetual Virginia Mary, it's an interesting question because this is one of these dogmas that has really nothing to do with our spiritual lives. And I'm in my living room and I go, ah! <laughs> he did not just say that, right? I added a chapter to the book. <laughs> it's called The Big Deal, Why the Perpetual Virginia Mary Matters for Your Spiritual Life, right? That, and, and I, in fact, inserted in every aspect of the book why every single aspect of, of Mary's life is crucial for our spiritual life and for our salvation. I mean, if you don't understand the Perpetual Virginia Mary, you are going to miss it on what marriage is, on what celibacy, consecration, the consecrated life, in fact, the concept of consecration, the sacred sacraments, everything blows up when you then have to answer the questions that come necessarily, and this is not the talk, by the way. That's a different talk. But the questions that come necessarily from your conclusion that Mary had other children. You've just opened Pandora's box. And in fact, historically, it is a fact the early reformers all accepted the perpetual Virginia Mary, and it was when they began to jettison it that everything blows up. All right. But my, my point is, my brothers, if you miss it on Mary as mother of God, I show you in the book, you're going to miss it on who God is, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Wait till you read that part. You're going to miss it on who Jesus is, it, two natures hypostatically joined in one person. You're going to miss it on virtually every aspect of the most important doctrines of the faith. This is why Lumen Gentium 65, the dogmatic constitution on the church, paragraph 65 says, in the life and person of the Blessed Virgin Mary, all of the most important doctrines of the faith are re-echoed. Notice it says re-echoed. It doesn't say she preaches all of the most important doctrines. Amen? She didn't preach at Pentecost. Why? Because she is the woman, not the Pope. Amen? But in her very life and being, she proclaims everything. She's the hammer of heretics 
as I point out in the book. Not only she reveals God to us, she reveals Jesus, who Jesus is, and especially when we get to co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and queenship, I show you how if you don't know who Mary is, you don't know who you are. In fact, you know what? We're going to touch on that at the end of this presentation. And then everybody in here is going to get the book, but there's only five copies left. So that means we're going to take a lot of orders. But guys, we will ship them to you with no shipping costs. But here's the bottom line. So Tim, why did you name it Behold Your Mother? All right. That's kind of, I just wanted to lay a little foundation for you right there. Well, we all know Bishop Sheen's masterful book, The Seven Last Sayings of Our Lord. It's a classic, beautiful, uh, recommend it highly. He actually wrote two books on that same topic. But as you know, one of those last sayings is, woman, behold your son, and son, behold your mother. And of course, that's where the title comes from. But if you think about this, and for my Protestant friends that are here, I think you will concur with me if you just, don't get mad at me, just think about it here. From a Protestant perspective, from a Lutheran perspective, justification by faith alone perspective, that scene in John chapter 19, verses 26 and 27, makes absolutely no sense. Because think about it, this is the most sacred moment in all of salvation history, right? The pinnacle of the redemption is about to occur. Jesus is hanging, dying on the cross. Our redemption. And yet... John is there, hiding behind the skirt of Mary, amen? All the other apostles had run, and John's, all right? But he is gazing up at his Savior. Oh, my goodness, right? By whom? It is faith alone, isn't it? <laughs> right? Faith alone in him. Your everything is right there. And the Savior says, look to my mom. Look to your mother. No, <laughs> Jesus, don't. Haven't you read Martin Luther? <laughs> Come on. What am I doing? Why are you telling me to look to my mother, Mary, when I'm looking at my salvation? You don't want to know why? Because Jesus wasn't Protestant. <laughs> he really wasn't. And the idea of justification by faith alone, which began with Martin Luther... In absolutely alien to the Christian consciousness for 1,500 years. Nobody taught it, including Wycliffe, including us. This is absolutely foreign. This idea that Luther taught that a lot of folks don't know. I told the folks last night, I was in a discussion with a Lutheran pastor not long ago, Missouri Synod Lutheran pastor, and the reason is because one of his parishioners, we were helping into the Catholic faith, and over time he was almost there, and he told me, he said, Tim, can I invite my pastor to come? Next, when we get together, I said, amen, brother. That's what I live for, man. And so we're at lunch, and we're talking, and we go on, and we get on to Luther. And I actually asked him, I said, you, you realize, right, that Luther denied free will? And he goes, well, not really. I said, yeah, really? Have you read Bondage of the Will? And he's like, well, maybe I did in seminary. I, I, you haven't read Bondage of the Will? This is his magnum opus. The whole thesis of the book is free will is a farce. And you haven't read it? I think as a Lutheran pastor, you should know what Luther teaches. I'm just saying. <laughs> but Luther, his whole thesis in Bondage of the Will is that free will is a farce. In fact, in two places in the book, he calls you, brother, what's your name? What is it? Rex. Rex. He says, you and I are like a beast. If God gets on our back and rides us, he'll rise to heaven. If the devil gets on our back and rides us, he'll ride it to hell. But he says, the beast has no choice as to who rides him. He taught our wills are entirely passive. We are like the beast. The whole, this is why Luther rejected so vehemently the idea of our preparing ourselves for grace. As the Council of Trent, Session 6, Canon 9 declares that we must. Luther and Calvin rejected that vehemently. Why? Because our wills are entirely passive. We say, no, we have to actively cooperate. And this is why Luther and Calvin also said, it, 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 
it's not our choice. Ultimately, it's not our choice. Now, we won't get into the distinction between passive reprobation of Luther and the double predestination of Calvin. They are distinct, not hugely, but they are distinct. But the bottom line is that the idea of the will is entirely passive. This is what leads to a lot of folks don't understand. Why did Luther, if you read his Babylonian captivity at 1520, when he attacks the mass that he calls the sacrament of the altar, and he says this is beyond anything the most demonic, evil teaching of the papists. It's the mass. Why? Now, he believed in the real presence. Why does he say the mass? Because they say the mass is a sacrifice. It's something we have to do. You have to offer the mass. You and I, as lay people, offer our sacrifice. We cooperate with what's going on, and the priest has to offer. And he says, no, the mass is we merely passively receive, and our faith is encouraged through gift, what is given to us. Are you with me? So any act, as Father Calloway pointed out, rosaries, it's a, ah! He reacts so, it's because that represents work. And the will is entirely passive. Folks, where do you think the me and Jesus theology came from? This is where it came from. And this is the fascinating thing, guys. If you read Luther early on, I mean, I mentioned Babylonian captivity, but yet you can read his prayer book of 1522. He, read, he wrote two years later where he is still advocating devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. He still advocates a communion of saints of sorts. Of course, it would blow up uh, later in his own life and definitely amongst his followers, although you still have it in, uh, among some Lutherans. But it's really schizophrenic because think about it. If you and I, if our wills, is anybody else getting excited or just me? I, I don't know. But look, if our wills are entirely passive, that means you and I, Rex, you and I have nothing at all to contribute to our own salvation. We have nothing because our wills are entirely passive. Well, look, if we can't contribute to our own salvation, what in the world can the Blessed Mother do? Amen? What in the world can any saint do? Nothing. And this is what would lead to the jettisoning. Uh, of the communion of saints, and in fact, to the point today where it's popularly, it's me and Jesus. All I need is Jesus, it's me and Jesus, which is so absolutely biblically absurd. When you think, think about what St. Paul says. St. Paul, I am sure, never read the Babylonian captivity of Martin Luther. He never read Bondage of the Will, that's for sure. Why? Because St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 21, can the head say to the foot, I have no need of thee? Can the eye say to the hand, I have no need of thee? Folks, we need each other, and by the way, for salvation. This is why Paul would say to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 16, a young bishop that he himself had ordained, he said, Timothy, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, for in so doing you will both save yourself and them that hear thee. <laughs> My Protestant friends, how many times have you heard your pastor preach that on Sunday morning? My brothers, you need to go out and save souls. <laughs> They'd be run out of their church. St. Paul would not be welcomed in Protestant churches all over the world. Are y'all with me? See, it's because of the cooperation that we understand and take for granted that is necessary for salvation. That's why Scripture can say we save our own souls and the souls of others. This is why Paul will say in Colossians 1.24, I fill up that which is lacking in the sufferings of Christ in my body for his body which is the church. This is why 2 Corinthians 1, 6, St. Paul will say, if I suffer, it is for your salvation. Amen? It is for your salvation and consolation, which is made effectual by your enduring the same sufferings that I suffer. Actually, he uses we suffer. Are you all with me? See, this idea of a Jesus only, all I need is Jesus, is crazy. It's like St. Pope Francis said, you know, churchless Christianity is insane. It makes absolutely no sense. That's like a head without a body. You know what a head is without a body? It's a corpse. Amen? This is the way God designed it. You see, we need each other and for salvation. So, one very important lesson Jesus gives us in saying, behold your mother. 
is that Jesus is not enough. Amen? Oh, oh, oh boy, red flag, heresy flag, heresy flag. Now, of course, Jesus is the first cause, the efficient cause of our salvation. Absolutely. Any good that comes through Mary and the saints comes from Jesus. But it's Jesus who tells us, I'm not enough because this is the way I designed it. I designed it so that members of a body, can you imagine a finger on my hand saying, you know what? I don't need the rest of this body. I'm going to jump off of here. What happens to the finger when it jumps off the body? It dies. <laughs> Amen? See, this is the way God designed our bodies. Well, the body of Christ is designed that way by God. And this is a lesson we get in Behold Your Mother, number one. Number two, and by the way, this is going to come back. Because really, when you say, you know, what's all this fuss about Mary? Mary is simply the ultimate example of the nature of the body of Christ and how important the body of Christ is. Of course, not diminishing the importance of Jesus, because without Jesus, without the head, there is no body. Amen. All right. But number two, behold, your mother is so important because, see, how many of y'all know God's pretty smart? Would you agree with me? God's pretty smart. And God knows, Jesus knows, that there are some things he can't be. Woo, heresy flag, heresy flag, right? There are some things that God cannot be, Jesus cannot be. For example, he can't be a mother. Now, wait a minute, Tim. Come on, that sounds crazy to me. Wait. Now, hold on a minute, because we know all the perfections that we attribute to motherhood, femininity, whether it's eminence, St. Augustine says God's more imminent to us than we are to ourselves. Wisdom, love, nurturing, all of those perfections are infinite in God. In fact, every perfection a woman has comes from God. Are you with me? That is true, and I'm not denying it, but God still is not revealed as mother. No, you can't pray our mother who art in heaven. Because he is father. He is. And this is the distinction the catechism of the Catholic Church makes in paragraph 239 and 240. And check the footnotes, too, because they quote some very, very important biblical texts concerning the fatherhood of God. God is revealed in the Old Testament to be like a mother, like a mother, nurtures like a mother. But he is father. Amen. But how many of you know it is deep within the race to need a mama? Amen? And how many of you know God knew that? Jesus knew that on the cross. And so in this most sacred moment, when Jesus is pouring out his heart unto death, he gives us not just a mother, but the perfect mother. Amen? That's number two. Number three, Jesus can be a lot of things, but you know Jesus can't be a disciple of Jesus. Did you know that? He can't. <laughs> he can't. Jesus can't be a disciple of Jesus. You know why? Because he's Jesus. But how many of you know Jesus knows we need mentors? We need fathers and mothers to look up to. This is why Paul, I said it in my first talk in 1 Corinthians 4, 14 and 15, will say, you have 10,000 instructors in the Lord Jesus Christ, but you have not many fathers. I've become your father, for I've begotten you through the gospel. And look at the next verse. He then says, I urge you, therefore, brethren, be imitators of me. Oh, I don't know about you guys, but I am not there. I, I, I want to get there. I really do. But I thank God we have men that are there. Amen. We have them, and we have women, we have mothers, we have fathers. And most of all, we need them. Isn't it amazing? When it comes to religion, we don't get this. Why is it that in sports, everybody understands? Remember the commercials that used to, I mean, they were 24-7, like Mike, if I could be like Mike, right? Now it's LeBron, I guess, right? Everybody knew as a young basketball player, you need an icon to look up to and say, man, I, I, that's what I want to get, Amen. And it engenders what? Hope within you that, hey, he got there, I can get there. Right? This is why we say with our lady, our life, our sweetness, and our 
Oh, but that's blasphemy. How can you say Mary is our hope when Colossians 1.27 says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus is our hope. Of course Jesus is our hope. Amen? We are not denying that. But it's Jesus, our hope, who makes Mary our hope in this sense. Because in Mary, we see concretized all of the promises and the grace of God, concretized, incarnate, if you will, in a real human person outside of the Godhead. Amen? And so our, our faith and our doctrines and our dogmas are not mere abstractions. They're concretized for us. And that engenders hope, which Hebrews chapter 6 says is the anchor of our souls. Without hope, people die. They perish. Romans 8, 24 says hope saves us. Amen? <gasps> you mean faith alone is wrong? Yes, it's wrong because we're saved by faith, hope, and charity. Amen? 1 Corinthians 13, 2. I, it, even if I have the faith to move mountains and have not charity, it profits me nothing. See, folks, these are just three reasons why I titled the book Behold Your Mother, because I think in those words, in fact, the whole book could have been about that. The, I mean, there's so much beauty in that title. But what I want to do in this last bit of time that I have with you, and I think it's a crime that I don't have enough time. I am voicing my complaint right now. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, kind of. Anyway, I want to put to rest the notion that, you know, what's all the fuss about Mary? You know, why? I mean, come on. And folks, I don't, I don't just hear this from Protestants. I hear this from Catholics. Catholics will say, man, it's, it's true, Tim. I mean, we put a lot of emphasis on Mary. I mean, why? why? Uh, you, you know what, folks? You cannot honor Mary too much. Do you know that? It's impossible. You know why? Because God's already honored her more than you possibly can. The only way you could dishonor her if you were to start worshiping her as a goddess, because but that's not honoring her. That's dishonoring. Amen? See? And we understand. All right. Here's what we're going to do, guys. And y'all get ready because we're going to have some fun. And I, and I do want to call out my good buddy there, Ron Rhodes, here. Because what we see in Scripture is a whole lot more than Mary just giving birth to Jesus. Although, as I said, you don't put the word just before having Jesus. Amen? Oh, Lord, have mercy. But not only, and this is going to be our focal point in our last few minutes together, is Luke chapter 1, verses 37 and 38, the incarnation of our Lord. There is no way we can put into terms properly the import of what Mary does when she says, let it be. But you know what we're going to do? We're going to come back to that to end this talk because I want to move forward. Are you hearing me, Ron? Maybe he's in the back. Because it doesn't stop there. Because not only do we have Mary at the incarnation, without her there is no incarnation. Amen? But what do we see? Does it stop there and Mary goes off and that's all we see? No. We saw in the gospel reading today the wedding feast of Cana, which we don't have time to do justice. But when you read my book, how many of you have already read it? Has somebody already read it? You know I take that apart, don't I? And I get more pushback on that than anything else. But uh, if anybody has any questions, just fire away. I, I, I uh, love that. But Mary doesn't have anything to do after the incarnation, huh? Well, what did we just read in the gospel? They have no wine. And we all know, folks, this was the disaster of disasters. You all know this, right, in the first century. Because did you know this is one thing we have in common with our Jewish friends? Without wine, a marriage is invalid. Did you guys know that? It is invalid. There is no, I'm joking. Somebody was going, what? <laughs> no, without wine, it's invalid. No, but wine is so, it's one of the reasons why I became Catholic. I mean, come on. I can, as Chesterton said, I can have my faith and I can have my pint. <laughs> but no, they have no one. They come to Mary, and of course Mary goes to Jesus. I'll just bring out one little point here to show kind of the import of Mary, but please get the book because I take it apart. You know, Mama basically comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, give him the wine. 
And Jesus' response, there's been a lot of ink spilled, my friends, but in Greek it's ti emoi kaisoi gune. What to me and to you, woman? My hour has not yet come. And I found everywhere I looked, I could not find until I found a wonderful little commentary. Father William Leonard, a Jesuit scripture scholar who's been dead for a long time now. But his commentary, or he's one of the many uh, who commented in the great work by Thomas Nelson and Sons, a Catholic commentary on sacred scripture. He makes the point here that I think a lot of folks miss here. When Jesus uses that language, my friend, and this is the one I get the pushback on more than anything else in the book, and including from Catholics, it's the language that Jesus uses. Ti emoi kaisoi. This is the strongest language Jesus could use that is basically saying to his mother, I am not going to do this. I don't want anything to do with this. This language is so strong. In fact, Father Leonard points out, it's a Hebraism, and I, in my book, I give you a litany of examples from the Old Testament of how this phrase is used. It is, get away from me, I don't want anything to do with you. And, in fact, in the New Testament, it's used, for example, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 29. Remember when the Gadarene demoniacs erupt? Remember, Jesus just walks into Gadara, and the demons do a Linda Blair, Right? Ah, head spin around, pea soup is flying. Well, maybe not, but the demons start crying out. Remember that? What do they say to Jesus? What is this between you and us? The only difference is they put it in the plural. Are you come to torment us before the time? In other words, get away from us. Jesus is using this strong language. It's a, I know people get, <gasps> they get sensitive when I say this. Jesus rebukes Mary. It's a rebuke. It's the language of rebuke. No, I'm not going to do this. Now, some of that's impossible. Jesus would never do that to his mother. You know what, folks? In Luke chapter 4, verse 1, the scripture says the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Amen? Folks, if Jesus is just a little bit greater than Mary. Amen. No, he's infinitely greater than Mary. Amen. And he's led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. we got to get away from this pious fluff. Let me tell you, Mary was not just tempted. She was tempted more powerfully than all of us combined. And she crushed every temptation immediately because of her fullness of grace. But that does not mean she was not tested. You better believe she was tested. And this is one example. This is a rebuke, as Father William Leonard points out, it's a rebuke ad mentem. It's a rebuke for a purpose. There's a greater purpose for us, for it as there is in everything in our lives, and we need to understand this. But it's a rebuke ad mentem for a purpose, analogous to, do you remember the Canaanite woman in Matthew Chapter 15, verses 23 through 28. Here's the Canaanite woman, Syrophoenician woman, who comes to Jesus. Jesus, she's weeping. My daughter is grievously vexed with a demon. Please help me, Jesus. And what does Jesus say? Oh, I'm so sorry. Let me heal her. Is that what he does? No, but that's what we expect in our mamby-pamby wimp 21st century version of Christianity. And in so much of our Catholic culture, this is a kind of Christianity that I'm telling you folks, we promote so often that, oh Jesus, he just loves you so much. He, like he holds the little lambs in his arms. He will hold you. You know, you know that's the kind of stuff that doesn't work when a mother is holding her child as it gasps for its last breath at two days old. Where does that theology fit in here? See, my friends, the cross is our salvation because of the reality of sin. And it's not just the cross of Jesus. No, he didn't do it all so that we don't have to do anything. I'm sorry if my Protestant friends are in here getting mad at me. Just talk to me later, brothers, but I'm here to tell you. Jesus did not suffer and die for our salvation so we don't have to. Jesus suffered and died so that our suffering and our death can be salvific. Amen? And the same is true for the Blessed Virgin Mary because she was meriting for all of us.
as what St. Irenaeus called in the second century, the cause of salvation to all of us. All right, hear me. Her suffering was beyond words, my friend. But, but notice, with the Canaanite woman, she comes to Jesus. Jesus, please help me. And what does Jesus do? I wish I could walk, but I can't. The microphone's got me stuck. But imagine, what does Jesus do? The Bible says he answers her not a word. Can you imagine this woman? My child is vexed with a demon. Please. And Jesus, the Bible says he just... He just kept walking. Oh my gosh, in today's culture. Jesus, you need sensitivity training. <laughs> that is all there is to it. You need to get in touch with your feminine side. And I'm not kidding. Go to seminaries across the country, my friend. Jesus answered her not a word, and then she cries out all the more. The apostle, this woman keeps crying after. So now, certainly, he's going to rebuke those apostles and say, don't you say that. You just come here, dearest one. Is that what he does? No. He says, I was not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. A second time, after she cries out all the more, I'm not sent to you. And he keeps walking. Wow. And I want you to know there's a change in her that happens. Notice how she goes from asking for her daughter's healing to then she says, Lord, please help me. Ha, 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 ha. Jesus is sneaky. Amen? See, whatever pain and suffering enters our lives, we have to understand it's for a greater purpose, namely our salvation and the salvation of others. And sometimes things can look absolutely horrid, but we have to have that faith. And we see it in the life of the Blessed Virgin Mary. But then, as you guys know, she cries out again a third time. And, and this is after Jesus. Oh, my gosh. The third rebuke is even stronger. Remember what he says? After she cries out all the more, what does he say? He calls her a dog. Please. He says, it's not right to take the food of the children and cast it to dogs. Now he calls her a dog. Ha <laughs> ha. What would he be called today? What would Jesus be called today? Yes, amen. He'd be called a lot of things. He would be called a lot of things, brother. You're right. We've become such a wimpy culture that we can't even handle a president who speaks bluntly with us because everybody's, oh my gosh, he said something mean. And they miss the point, don't they, brother, about what about the slaughter of 60 million babies that we have a chance to reverse and turn around. But, oh, but, but he says mean things, right? Are you all with me? See, Mary encounters a test when Jesus says, Tia moi kai soi gune, what to me and to you, woman? My hour is not yet come. In other words, I am not going to do this. But guess what? Mary doesn't need three times, does she? <laughs> Mary immediately. She's, t talk about tuned in, she's like, uh, get ready, here comes the miracle. <laughs> in other words, Jesus says, no, I am not going to do this. Uh, here comes the miracle. Why? Because I'm the mommy. <laughs> I'm the mommy, that's why, right? And Jesus performs the miracle. And by the way, verse 11 says, and thus he began to manifest his glory, and the apostles began to believe in him through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary here, after a tremendous test, they came to faith in him. But Mary didn't have anything to do with anything, did she? <laughs> oh, my Lord. Can we do one more real quick? I wish we had time. We don't. But I'm just going to do one more. How about the prophecy in Luke chapter 2, verses 34 and 35? Remember Simeon's prophecy? When Simeon sees, and we can never imagine in our minds what Simeon experienced oh my lord he was promised by the holy spirit he would not die until he sees the glory of his the messiah the salvation and glory of israel as he would later say and he sees the holy family and the spirit says that's him and he goes he makes a beeline right for him poor joseph he gets cast aside and he says to his mother Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel to be a sign of contradiction. The cross, amen? Foolishness to the Greeks and a stumbling block to the Jews, right? Oh, we could have a whole talk on that one. 
but in the next breath. And of course we know, what does he mean? The fall and rising again of many. Who are the many? All who will be saved. Amen. The entire family uh, of God. And by extension, the entire world. But in a special way. You know, as 1 Timothy 4 verse 10 says, Jesus is the Savior of all especially those who believe. There's a special relationship with those who believe we can receive the Eucharist, amen? They can't who are outside. He's the savior of all, but specially those who believe. So the many are specially those who believe the family of God, but of course Jesus died for everyone. But here's the bottom line. Who are the many? Everybody. And then in the next breath, he says, and a sword will pierce your soul. And notice it says soul, not heart. That's important because it's psuche. She's being called to be a white martyr. A sword will pierce not your body, but a sword will pierce your soul. That the thoughts, in Greek, it's the dialogsmoi, ek cardion. That the thoughts out of the heart, ek, ek cardion polon in Greek, that the thoughts or the dialogue of the hearts out of many would be manifest or revealed. Oh, my Lord. As Pope St. John Paul the Great says in his great encyclical letter, Salvafici Dolores, paragraph 25, this represents Mary and Jesus prophetically. It is said right here that they will suffer together. Jesus on the cross, Mary at the foot of the cross, and the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Sacred Heart of Jesus would be so joined in suffering. He says that her, her sufferings would be so integrally joined with his that they would become a participation in the redemption of all. <laughs> there you have co-redemptrix right there, baby. Oh, you got to get my book. All right. Because I wish we had more time. We don't. Here's the bottom line. I would think... Mary has a little bit more to do with this. Are you all with me? That Mary is prophetically called to suffer and die with Jesus for all of us. Her spiritually at the foot of the cross. Him physically on the cross. And we don't have time to do the book of Acts and the book of Revelation that takes it into eternity. Where Mary is front and center in the cosmic battle between the kingdom, as St. As Augustine would say, the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this world. Amen? We definitely have, don't have time to do that because we'll be here till midnight and y'all won't like me anymore. So I'm going to back up and conclude our remarks by let's back up because guys and girls, one thing I have learned the longer I am Catholic is on one level it's as simple as simple can be. We proclaim Jesus Christ for the salvation of the world. We call everyone to repent, believe the gospel, and endure till the end. That's what this whole thing is about. It is a simple message, but if you want to dive deep, you can dive for a billion years and you'll never plumb the depths of this incredible faith of ours. And man, did I learn that again and again in writing this book on the Blessed Virgin Mary. Our faith is awesome. But let's go back to Luke chapter 1, verses 37 and 38, and we're going to put to rest right now once and for all what is all the fuss about Mary. We all know the story. In Luke chapter 1, verse 26, the angel Gabriel comes down to a 14-year-old little girl. Ha <laughs> ha, this drove Calvin crazy. Oh, a 14-year-old little girl and announces she is being called to be the mother of God, the mother of the Messiah, the Son of God. Look at verse 33 whose kingdom shall have no end. And then, of course, Mary responds as any young virgin who has a vow of perpetual virginity would. <laughs> How shall this be? And if you have a New American Bible, do me a favor, put a big X through the word can. This is one of my Greek professor's pet peeves when I was at St. Charles Borromeo, Father Patrick Brennan. Put an X through that can. How can this be? There was not one shred of doubt in Mary. Ken is a terrible translation. It's estai. It's not dunatai. It's not how is this able. It's estai. How shall this be? Mary believed she knew it was going to happen, but she had a really good question. Man, how are you going to do this? Because I'm not planning on having sexual relations. Can you tell me that? And she had no way of knowing it until God revealed it. Y'all with me? Anyway, that's a different talk too. <laughs> I keep doing that. 
How shall this be? For I know not man. And the angel immediately responds, I'll tell you how. The power of the Most High will overshadow thee. I have a whole lot of fun with episkiaze soy there. Oh, the power of the Most High will overshadow thee. I will with, I got to keep away from the temptation. I will not go into that. Okay will overshadow thee. Therefore, that holy one which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And this is the sixth month with your cousin Elizabeth who was called barren, for nothing shall be impossible with God. I remember when we were in Greek class at St. Charles Borromeo with Father Patrick Brennan, just died a few years ago. One of my dearest friends in my entire Catholic life. He was my spiritual director, taught me Greek, taught me Latin. One of a, a ridiculously, come on, two PhDs and six master's degrees. That should be against the law. Can't have people that smart. Oh, my gosh. Oh, I can tell you stories about him. But I remember in class, we were translating this very text. I remember Father Brandon saying, you know, son, he used to call us sons. Sons, and he wore that Jesuit cassock, man. I'm sorry. Nobody has got anything on the Jesuit cassock, bro. I mean, why don't they wear them? Those, the thick sash, bro. Oh, oh, he... He used to walk around the campus in that cassock praying the rosary every day. He would walk through the streets of Philadelphia in war zones, and he was protected. <laughs> you know? I'll tell you a quick story. I went to have lunch with <laughs> y'all again. So, Tim, would you stop telling stories? All right. I was there. I came to visit. I was doing a talk for the Bioethics Center in Philadelphia. I was doing a day of recollection for all the guys there. It's a great organization, by the way, Dr. John Haas at all. So I'm doing a day of recollection. I go over to see Father. He was at Star of the Sea there in Philly in the middle of a horrible neighborhood where, you, you know, with this color skin, you're kind of hiding, right? And so I go there, and Father's like, all right, let's go to lunch. We'll walk. And I'm like, Father, you sure you want to walk? Your car works really well. <laughs> yeah, it's not that far. I'm like, dude, this neighborhood. I mean, when I was driving in there, there's burnout cars and people. That, can we drive? Tim, come on. So we're walking through the neighborhood. Here's Father, Jesuit, clad. In, you know, and uh, here's these guys over working on a car, right? And they look over, and they go, hey, hey, Father. It was like Rocky Balboa. I, I'm, I'm in a movie here. I just, hey, yo, father, can you come over here and bless this piece of shh, shh, shh. Oh, I can't say that here. Right. Can you bless this piece of They actually said it. And they go, oh, father, sorry. I didn't mean to say that to you. But can you? And you know what? Father's response. Here is a world-class scholar, but he loved being in the inner city. He says to them, Guys, you know what? You know what you need. Were you in church? When's the last time you've been in church? Huh, Petey? When's the last time you've been? Well, you know, Father, I've been meaning to, you know. It was incredible. So, I'll tell you what. I'll bless your car, and then I'm going to bless you, and I want to see you in mass. Right? I was going, holy cow. What a priest. Right? This is Father. But he said, let me tell you something. Sons. He was a pugnacious Irishman, man. Tough as nails. A pug nose. Tough guy. Anyway. He said, when you see in your modern Bibles, nothing shall be impossible with me. He said kind of tongue-in-cheek. And by the way, I let him read my book, and he critiqued it. I wanted to be sure I got this right, because I didn't want his wrath on me. <laughs> and he gave me the thumbs up. But he said, nothing, and it's kind of hy hyperbolic, you know. He says, nothing could be a worse translation than nothing, because there's nothing in this verse about nothing. In fact, nothing really isn't there. In my book, I show you word by word in the Greek how... They translate it that way, and you really have to do back somersaults to twist the scriptures to interpret it that way, or to translate. As Father said, it can be done, but you're making mince mean. You end up actually leaving out a word in your translation when you do that. All right? The literal translation is, and you guys get this. This is going to be the last point. Guys, take this home. Somebody, somebody's going to shout hallelujah here in a minute because this is going to get so good right now. What's your name? Brock. Brock. You're Brock. Brock, this is going to get so good right now that I wish I was sitting where you are so I could hear it. All right, that's what I'm talking about. All right, right now. But he said, when we look at the Greek text, it doesn't say nothing. It actually says pan rema tu feu. Pan rema, pan. means every, like pan America, pan. Every rema 
to theu. Every, the two main words for word in Greek, rhema, logos. Rhema, not always, they can be interchangeable, but generally it's kind of a, the speech, a spoken word, whereas logos is more, can be written, like the person of the logos and that sort of, kind of, you know, it's not airtight there, but rhema often has that speech. And by the way, that's why some of the guys, they'll translate it thing, is because speech to the Hebrew mind is a thing, it's real. It's more real than my hand in front of my face, but all right, here we go. Every word of God, every rhema of God, and then it does something funny. It says, shall not be not possible. Now, we don't do that in English. You don't say not, not. <laughs> you, know, you get a red mark. But in Greek, double, double negatives are used everywhere. Sometimes, in fact, for, to accentuate a positive. It can be actually used that liter in a literary sense, but... At any rate, so it's, as Father points out, every word of God shall not be not possible. You cancel the two nots, you put them together, and it's a positive. Every word of God shall be possible. And my friends, this would have been, and this is what folks miss. And I'm going to tell you something. The reason why the Greek fathers especially, but the Latin fathers as well, emphasize this text more than any other. When you read homilies, even as late as St. Bernard of Clairvaux, but you go back St. Cyril at the Council of Ephesus, when they get on this verse, this verse is so beautifully exegeted and preached on as changing the universe. And today we pass right over it. And as Father pointed out, it's because we've missed the richness of the language here. That's one problem anyway. There's more problems, but that's one of them. Here's the point. Every word of God shall be possible. Are you kidding me? As Father Brandon said, to the Hebrew mind, the word of God is not possible. It's actual. The word of God is more real, as I said before, than my hand in front of my face. Think about Genesis chapter 1. God said, let there be light. And what happened? <laughs> and in fact, you know what the Hebrew says? God said, let there be light. And there already was light. Why? Father Brandon said this in class. He said, by the time the inspired author could write the next verse, he had to put it in the past tense. God said, let there be light. And there already was light. Why? Because God's word is more real than the... The entire universe. I mean, this is why Psalm 33, verse 6, right around 6, 7, 8, says God spoke the word and all the worlds came into being. This is why Hebrews 11, 3 will say, by faith we know the worlds were created through the word of God. And there it's rhema, by the way, the spoken word. <laughs> oh, is anybody else getting this? Because this is about ready to get good right now. This is the last thing. We have come to the end. And those of you who have survived are about to get blessed right now, because here it is. Every word of God shall be possible. Father Brandon says, oh my gosh, that would sound crazy. Right? Every word of God, no. Think about Jesus. You know, another one popped in my head. Jesus said, heavens and earth shall pass away, but what? My word. Another proof of Jesus' divinity. His word will never pass away. Why? Because he is the word, and the word is God. Folks, the word of God is not possible. It's actual. What could this possibly mean? It means everything. What it is saying is every word of God is possible in the sense of contingent upon, and this is what drove John Calvin crazy, contingent upon the response of a 14-year-old little girl. Can anybody see Mary's kind of important? Contingent upon the, but wait a minute, God would never place the salvation and the transformation of the universe into the hands of a 14-year-old. Are you crazy? God loves doing stuff like that. <laughs> what does St. Paul, God chooses the weak to confound the strong. God chooses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, the weak to confound the strong. God loves taking a 14-year-old girl and changing the universe. But that's what he did. Listen to this. Every word of God, and I'll ask you one last question. When he says every word of God is possible, what word is he referring to? Amen. You are the first one that's gotten that right. In a, what's your name? Dennis. He just said it. All of them. <laughs> Amen. You're the first one. I've been giving this talk for three years, and you're the first one that got it right just like that. That's right. What do you, every word of God shall be about. What word is he talking about? All of them. 
every word of God, referring to the proto-evangelium of Genesis 3.15 to he'll be born of the tribe of Judah in Genesis 49.10 to Emmanuel, Isaiah 7.14, born in Bethlehem, Micah 5, 1 and 2, wonderful counselor. Every, we could go through scores of them. The word of God and the oral word of God, all the words of God are contingent upon the response of a 14-year-old little girl. St. Bernard of Clairvaux, in one of the greatest two homilies, in my humble opinion, ever preached, and I quoted in my, in fact, I quote from both of them in my book, St. Cyril's famous homily that shook the world at the Council of Ephesus in 431. Oh, my Lord. And St. Bernard of Clairvaux, we don't have time to touch, but get my book. <laughs> we don't have time to touch St. Cyril, but let me go. St. Bernard, it's called In Praise of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And he gives an exegesis on this very text, my friend, when he says, when the angel asked the question of Mary, he then awaited her response. Have you ever seen Fra Angelico's famous Annunciation painting? It's a masterpiece. I have it on my screen on my computer. The, the great Fra Angelico. He depicts it so beautifully. You know, Mary is there, and Mary is seated in the presence of the angel, which is crazy, right? Because in Hebrew culture, you stand when you're in the presence of a superior. Amen? Why would she be seated? Because she's the queen of angels, who even this side of the veil was greater than all the angels combined, even before her glorification, because she's full of grace. The angel is going to a knee, also depicting the fact that she's being called to be the spouse of the Holy Spirit. And the angel is asking for her hand for the Holy Spirit. Fra Angelico was a Franciscan. The Franciscans championed the spouse of the Holy Spirit. Anyway, the angel is going down on a knee and Mary is seated. St. Bernard says, when the question is asked, the angel then humbly awaits her response. And not only her, but the patriarchs in paradise. And we could add, all the angels of God were gathered around at that moment. And they're basically saying, come on, Mary, say yes, Mary. And why? Because we're not Calvinists. Amen? She was entirely free. All of heaven awaited her response. And when she said, let it be done unto me according to thy word, there was an explosion of grace. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. All of us could be saved. And reverberations were felt throughout a hundred billion light years because of the response of a 14-year-old little girl. I think Mary's kind of important. And the last question I'm going to ask you, sir, has anybody ever, if you don't think Mary's great, has anybody ever awaited your response? Do you ever have all the angels of God await your response? Now, see, I hear a lot of no's. You know what? I set you up. If you answered no, you don't know who you are. And this is one of the things that Mary helps us to see. Yes, doesn't Luke, Luke tell us all the angels? Angels of heaven rejoice over the repentance of one sinner. Amen? Do you know the angels of God are awaiting your response every time you receive the Eucharist? If you receive our Lord well and you say yes, you can change your life, your family's life, and reverberations can be felt. No, we're not called to be Mary and change the whole universe, but we can change our world. When we understand in her, we see who we are. Man, that can change everything. God bless you.